Today, we're discussing the concept of possibilities. And it is such a joy to welcome Professor Thomas Ord again. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm looking forward to a, another conversation. Last time, we, um, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation on perfection. And one of the ideas that we touched on while speaking about perfection is the idea of possibilities, the possibilities that are available to us in every moment. <clears throat> I, I think we will again today touch on a few related ideas to possibility, but at least we will give possibility our focus <laughs> and then work from there on the other ideas, hopefully in the future. Um, I wonder, maybe maybe I'll start just with an introduction on some thoughts and then hand it over to you, Thomas. Um, for me, practically, what possibilities means for, for people in their daily lives and in their relationship with God, it probably becomes clearer if we provide a contrast and one of the best contrasts that i understand to the concept of possibility is the concept of certainty and i know that within my christian environment and background there's much more excitement or sympathy for the idea of certainty <laughs> than what there is for the idea of possibility. For me, the, uh, the beauty of possibility is that it can never be reduced to certainty. Uh, if language means anything, a possibility is not a certainty. <laughs> and the certainty is not a possibility. Um, that might, you know, that, that's common sense, but very often I think there's a inclination to be more comfortable with certainties and a bit of a nervousness about possibilities. Um, but I'll start with that idea. How, how would you think of possibilities in a practical way of where it connects with people. Yeah, I think possibilities are kind of like breathing. You know, we just live as if they are true. We don't really think about them very much. Yes. And since possibilities aren't things we can see with our eyes or just kind of aspects of our, of our reality, we oftentimes don't uh, spend much time pondering the nature of them and how important they are to our lives. Mm -hmm. and, and you've picked out one of the key ones, I think, and that is um, if we live in a world of possibilities, mm -hmm. that suggests that things aren't determined, they aren't mm -hmm. fixed or set. And if they're not fixed or set, then we can't be absolutely certain <laughs> about how things are going to play out, uh, not only in the future, but we also can't be absolutely certain we know exactly what happened in the past or what's happening in the present. Yes. And so in philosophy, we call this epistemic uncertainty. That is, mm -hmm. we don't know with certainty uh, what the world is like, what the future would be. And the, talking about possibilities is a way to talk about epistemic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. For me, it's interesting that it's both within philosophy and within theology that there is yeah. a group who loves certainty, like, like <laughs> scientific determinism. We, we try and uh, explore the idea that if we only have all the information to our disposal of what the state of any uh, uh, environment is, we can predict with certainty what it will be in the future. Right. And the logical difficulty with that is that if we analyze it, it basically says that the past contained the present and yeah. the present contains the future. 
And in effect, there is no real difference between future, <laughs> present, uh, and, and the past. It's really just a reconfiguration of what has always been. Mm -hmm. But I think it's quite important to maybe start just on a scientific uh, uh, level and say that that is philosophical speculation. There is no science that actually proves that that's the case. That's right. And I think what we have benefited from maybe in the past 150 plus years within the science community as well is a greater and greater appreciation of the indeterminacy that that's present within science so so for instance the heisenberg principle of uncertainty which basically says even if we have all the information about what forces we're going to apply to a, an electron we cannot say with certainty how it will react and it's not because of a, a lack of information. It's because at the very smallest uh, fabric of reality, there's always more than one possibility available to us. Now, yeah. um, so that, that idea that possibilities is part of the fabric of reality. And the way in which we can contrast that to determinism, what do you, how would you describe what that could mean to a person in their ordinary lives? Yeah, well, it has so many implications. We could talk all day about them, but let me, um, let me talk about what it means in terms of what we can expect from ourselves and from each other. So, you know, a hundred years ago, someone might say something like, well, the atoms have totally determined who we are. Um, and then that sort of way of thinking kind of disappeared, especially as you mentioned, uh, when quantum theory emerges and there seems to be uncertainty or indeterminacy at the smallest levels of existence. Mm. 50 years ago in psychology, a, a form of psychology was really a popular called behaviorism. And it said our genes totally determine us. Mm. So we don't have any possibilities to be anything different than what our genes tell us they're going to be. Others said, well, that's actually not the genes, it's your environment. It's the way you were brought up, um, what you were taught, your social location, your setting. You don't really have any freedom to be anything other than what you're determined to be by your environment. Mm. Well, that, that way of thinking in science has all but disappeared, at least amongst uh, the, the leading psychologists today. Now, today, there are some in neuroscience who say, you're totally determined by your brain structure. Your neural activity totally determines who you are and who you're going to be. You don't have any true freedom, mm. and therefore um, you don't have any, you know, no responsibility. Yeah. And I think that's the, the, the point I want to sort of focus in response to your question. Um, it's very difficult for us to make sense of moral responsibility moral responsibility for ourselves and for others, if in fact we're not, uh, if, if we're totally determined, if we don't mm. have any freedom, mm. we can't really expect our kids, our partners, our yes. associates, even our enemies to be any different than what they are if there are no possibilities, if they're entirely determined by, you know, the genes, mm. their neurons, whatever. Um, but I think in reality, Moral responsibility is true, is correct. We can expect something more of ourselves, our family members, even our enemies, because we're not entirely determined. We have yes. some measure of freedom to choose among possibilities. Beautiful. I, I, I saw in one of the um, latest scientific philosophical magazines where this a person argues for the idea that there is no free will, but they always conclude with 
Well, if this is true, we just want to say that it would be better to live as if you do have freedom. <laughs> so, so it kind of just shows how impractical or out of touch it is with real life. We can have these theories of you have no freedom and everything's determined, but in reality, we would like to keep people responsible for their choices. <laughs> um, uh, reminds me very much of a famous book written in the 1970s by the world's most famous atheist, Richard Dawkins. Mm. The title of this book is The Selfish Gene. Mm. And in the first few pages, he tells us we are robots blindly programmed by our genes. Mm. And in the very final pages, he says, but we need to pick ourselves up and we need to act as as if we're not really determined by our genes. <laughs> That's a great exactly. illustration of what you, what you say. Yeah, so we, we have a theory, but it's actually not applicable to real living at all. Um, <laughs> right. So the, the idea that, and here we can already see how possibilities and freedom can't really be separated. Possibilities is the openness and, and it implies that you have freedom to choose between what might or might not be. Now, in that same vein of thinking, I think where it becomes even more problematic within theology is the question of whether possibilities are real for God. Are right. they only real for us or are they real for God? And, right. and that, that comes again, it, it touches on freedom. Do we really have freedom to make choices? But if God knows with absolute certainty what the future is and what we will choose, and by the way, friends, many of you might are probably aware of these conversations. Some of you might not, but there, there are people who argue that you have real freedom to make choices, but God knows with absolute certainty what those choices will be. And so I want to make a logical distinction there and then ask you for your input, uh, Thomas, but if anybody knows, whether it's God or anybody else, if anybody can with certainty calculate what your choice will be tomorrow, whether you drink, you know, we can make it something really important or something trivial, whether you're going to choose to drink tea or coffee in the morning, if anybody knows with absolute certainty what you will do. I think it is logical to say that that is no longer a possibility, mm -hmm. that it is a certainty, that all the conditions, all the information that was going to uh, uh, influence your choice towards coffee rather than tea mm -hmm. are so set that you might think you have a, a, a possibility in front of you, but actually it's, it's only a certainty. Um, again, I think that is where the reality of freedom and possibility then offers a challenge to the idea that God knows the future with absolute certainty. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I like the way you've laid that out. I sometimes uh, like to talk about three ways of thinking about the possibilities of the future and God's knowledge and our freedom. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, we'll call it classic determinism. Mm -hmm. It says that God has determined everything in advance, predestined, predetermined, foreordained. These are all words people use. And that means that whatever we think we are, are going to choose tomorrow, it's already been decided in a long chain of causes and like dominoes mm. so that there are no possibilities for tomorrow because the past has been determined by God or by the atoms. But here we're talking about God. Um, in that kind of scenario, God can foreknow with certainty what we're going to do because we don't have any options to do other than what God has already determined from yes. this long chain of events. 
The second option, and this one I'll call an Arminian view of uh, foreknowledge, it says, no, God hasn't determined everything. We're not a part of a pre-decided, predestined chain of events. We're really going to have a choice in the future, but in some strange way, God knows with absolute certainty what we're going to choose tomorrow. Mm. God doesn't cause us to choose these things, but somehow God knows with certainty we're going to choose X instead of Y. Mm -hmm. The problem with that line of thinking is that if God knows with absolute certainty what we're going to do, and God can't make a mistake, it seems as though we can't choose amongst possibilities. Otherwise, mm -hmm. God would be wrong. Yeah. Or another way to put it is, God could only know with certainty what the future will be if that future is already settled, mm -hmm. fixed, complete. Yes. But a future that's fixed, settled, and complete isn't a future with possibilities. Yes. And so that's why I and you and many of us say, it makes a lot more sense to say God yes. can't know with absolute certainty what we're going to choose tomorrow. Yeah. And how boring it would be to know everything with absolute certainty. <laughs> I, I was trying to, to think of maybe one of the podcasts we should do is the, the omniscient God versus the omniboring God, because I think, <laughs> I think we have created through a misinterpretation of what omniscience means, an yeah. omniboring God. And, and I mean that quite literally in the definition of the word boring, which basically means nothing new happens. <laughs> and I think many have imagined a God for whom nothing new happens because he just knows it all. But uh, there's something very adventurous and beautiful and joyful about possibilities that are real, not only for us, but for God. Um, you know, one of the things that, that it seems I often wonder why people are nervous about some of these ideas. And one of the things I observed is the nervousness of if God does not know with certainty, <laughs> then, then how can he promise to fulfill or how can he achieve his good plans and purposes for us? If God's not in control, and we certainly know that we are not, then how can we guarantee that good will triumph over evil? Does possibilities and freedom, does it diminish God? Or do you think it, in a way, um, maybe adds value to, to the character of God? Well, I don't think it diminishes God, but I do think it prompts us to ponder carefully what we think is guaranteed in the future, what mm. God guarantees, what we can do, what kind of um, what kind of future might be. And amongst people who don't think God knows the future, there are a variety of proposals to think about that. Mm. Um, the kind of proposal that I find most satisfying does have some guarantees, mm. and I'll list off some of them. First of all, it's guaranteed that God will never leave us or forsake us. Mm. Um, it's it. also guaranteed that God will always love us, never stop loving us, because mm. it's God's nature. It's also guaranteed, in my view, that God always invites us into a loving relationship. There's never a time in which God says, you know, Andre, he has screwed up so many times. I've mm -hmm. given him so many chances. Tough luck to yeah. hell with him. I'm not giving him any more chances. No, mm. I think God, whose love is relentless, always invites us to, um, mm. to have a love relationship. And then at fourth, I think it's guaranteed that when we say yes to God and cooperate, 
we begin to mold our lives into becoming more and more like Jesus. We become yes. Christ-like. And in that, we develop a kind of character that is generous. It mm -hmm. has full of abundant life. And that's the kind of thing I think God is most interested in. I don't mm -hmm. think God is most interested in making sure, you know, I get my way. Mm -hmm. I think God is most <laughs> interested in developing love relationships with everything God creates. Yes. And the common sense way I, for me to think about it is the way in which parents treat their kids. We don't typically think of a parent who is absolutely controlling, one who wants to dominate and decide for their children what their path in life would be. We don't associate that with great parenting. We, yeah. we, we normally think of the kind of parent who is able to instill a sense of responsibility and adventure, the kind of parent that will instill the values that will enable them to give their children freedom with confidence. Uh, that's the kind of parenting that we value. And uh, I can see that in our ABBA as well. Uh, yeah. ABBA that delights in our freedom. As I was uh, just pondering how possibilities are real for God as well, uh, I was trying to think of just a quick biblical example and where God is surprised. <laughs> mm. You know, most people can't stomach the idea that anything surprises God. They want God to <laughs> be in control. But then I thought of the parable, you know, in Luke 15 again, where Jesus compares his father and the kingdom of heaven with the story of the prodigal. Now, the father hoped his son would return Mm. But the joy that he experienced when the son actually returned was the joy of surprise. And, and I know within psychology as well, they tell us that there's a level of joy that can only come through surprise. You know, mm, there's, yeah. a, there's a different type of satisfaction that you have or joy or happiness that you have when everything works out according to plan, that's a different joy to the joy where you are surprised at something happening outside of the plan and it's better. And, and that's what we see in Luke 15. The dad sees him, he runs, he's excited. Yeah. And then it says all of heaven rejoices. It's not like they had this party planned all along because they knew it's going to happen. No, there's a, there's a level of joy in God that has to do with the fact that he has given us the possibility of surprising him. <laughs> mm, I that's love beautiful. it. Yeah, I love that's it. That's beautiful. Okay. That actually reminds me of another passage of scripture that mm. I think points us to possibilities. And mm. uh, maybe I'll preface it by saying there's a two-letter word that I think is crucial for us to think about possibilities. And that mm. two-letter word is if, mm. I-F, if. Mm. If suggests that there are possibilities. And I'm reminded of that classic phrase, I think it's in Chronicles, in which the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will X, then I will do one thing. But if they don't, then I will do another thing. That sounds like the future is open. Yes, <laughs> if, absolutely. If we do this, God's going to react this way. If we do that, God's going to react another way, or there's yes. going to be certain outcomes. And um, that's just another example, in addition to the prodigal son, yeah. of the way the Bible has, it's the Bible, I think, assumes possibilities yes. in its pages. And I think many times, 
I know a lot of believers who act very similarly to Jonah, who's kind of upset with God's freedom of being better <laughs> than what, <laughs> what they declared is going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Jonah, who, who the Lord tells him, go and tell them destruction's coming if you go in this way. And then the city of Nineveh obviously turns to God and God says, Okay, no more distraction. I'm, I'm right. accepting you. I'm embracing you. And he's so mad. He says he's mad enough to die. <laughs> he would rather God just stick to one certain plan <laughs> than, than change his mind. Yeah. yeah, what's strange in that story is that the people of Nineveh repent and then God repents. <laughs> so yes. there's all kinds of changing going on there yes. uh, again. Uh, changing is only, we can only make sense of it if there are genuine possibilities, yes. not only for us, but also for God. Yeah. So I just want to conclude and, and, um, and say that the gospel is such beautiful, good news that mm -hmm. no matter what, what past has brought you to this moment, the God for whom all things are possible invites you into a future that has joy beyond what your past can supply, that has relationship, love, meaning, that is possible beyond just the contribution of what has been. And the God of possibility invites you to participate with him in making what is most beautiful and most meaningful real in your life. Mm, beautifully said. Thomas, thank you so much for your time again. And um, I hope there are many more fees. <laughs> I do too. Thanks for the opportunity, Andre. Bless you. Bye-bye.